The month of January is named after the Roman god Janus, who was pictured as a man with two faces. One face was looking backwards, and one face was looking forward. He was the god in Greek mythology of doors, of beginnings and endings. And January is a month of beginning and endings. In January, it's like the whole world just breathes this breath of fresh air. For a brief moment, people believe in January that their lives can be different. This year, I'm going to read my Bible more. This year, I'm going to pray more. This year, I'm going to decrease my waistline. I wonder, do you have a list of things, New Year's resolutions that you made in the month of January? You know, when I was in Dallas, um, every year, this, I saw the same thing happen in the gym that we would attend. Uh, I had a membership at a gym, and us, a group of us guys, we used to go uh, early mornings on Wednesday morning and Friday morning to play basketball in the gym. Well, usually my American friends, they played basketball. I just ran around a lot. But we used to go, and we used to play basketball. And, um, and every January, the gym would be filled with people. Filled with people who are going to dream the impossible dream, scale the impossible height, uh, live the impossible thing. Filled with people who this year were going to lose weight. But by February, that broad river of enthusiasm had then decreased to like a little trickle. And then by March, it had completely dried up and we had our gym back. You see, if January tells us anything, it tells us that life change is difficult. It's hard. Life change is not just sustainable on the feelings of newness that January bring. You know, true life change is not just a result of the calendar. It's not something superficial. If your life is truly going to change, it's going to have to be through a deeper process. And I think many of us know that. Because many of us now have become so hardened to January's temptations that even when we talk about life change, many of you are sitting there and thinking, Timon, you can talk about life change, but life change is a bit of a myth. It's a little bit like the Tooth Fairy or the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. Some people might believe in it, but it's really a myth. True life change is something that I really rarely see. Well, in the passage that we just heard read out, Genesis chapter 32, we see that Jacob experienced true and lasting life change. Life change that was something that was deeper than just the feelings of January. And this is really the climax of his story as we come into Genesis chapter 32. If you've been joining us for the first time, we've been studying through the book of Genesis, and we've been studying through the life of Jacob in a series that we've called Wrestling with God. And we've seen so far that Jacob has been wrestling with control in Genesis 25 to Genesis 27 and 28. We saw last week that, that, uh, that Jacob was, was struggling or wrestling with um, issues of emptiness in Genesis uh, 29 and, and chapter 30. And in Genesis chapter 31, um, after dealing with Laban, um, Jacob, he, he goes on this journey in Genesis, in Genesis 32 and 33. He goes through a journey through, through Jabok, uh, through Menahem, and through Jabok, and through Peniel. And this journey that Jacob takes transforms his life. And unless you, my friend, go through a similar journey, unless you go through a journey through Menahem, and Jabok, and Peniel, your life will never change. So let's have a look at this journey that Jacob went on. Look down in your Bibles in chapter 32 and verse 1. Just look at that verse, verse 1. We read this. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said to them, This is the camp of God. So he named the place Menahem. Our daughter, Ava, she turned 11 this past week. I can't believe how grown up my children are getting. Ava is almost as tall as me now. But when she was much younger, here's a picture of her when she was younger, when she was two years old. One of the things that Ava loved to do is she loved to go swimming. And she was just starting to talk and as soon as she would see a pool, she would say these words. She would say, I go swim, I go swim. And on this one time after church, our family went to another family in the church uh, over their place for lunch and they had a pool 
And as soon as Ava saw the pool, she said, I go swim, I go swim. Now, of course, Ava was only two at the time. And so she couldn't really swim. And of course, she wasn't even tall enough to stand up in the shallow end of the pool. So she, she would just sit on the steps of the pool. This pool had these steps. And she would just stand on those steps. And of course, throughout the whole time that she was swimming, I was standing right there by Ava's side and, and just not letting her out of my sight. Now, as we were swimming, as Ava was swimming, just for one second, she stepped off the step and she started to sink beneath the waves. And I just saw that and grabbed her and pulled her back up on the step. And without any fuss, completely oblivious to the fact that she'd almost drowned, Ava went on swimming. I go swim, I go swim. And I thought to myself, I wonder if she reali even realizes that I'm here. I wonder if she's even conscious of my presence. Well, the Bible teaches that for believers, God is present with them. And in some mysterious way that I can't actually explain to you, God and his angels are fighting for believers. And what Jacob has got here is God has given Jacob a revelation. The veil has been lifted. And Jacob is able to see that God and his angels are with him. You see, the word camp in Hebrew is the word maniah. Here's, here's it in, in Hebrew. Maniah is the word. The guy on the PowerPoint, wake up. Here's the word. Maniah, camp. But he doesn't label it just maniah. He actually changes the word to this to maniam. And by changing the ending of the word, he makes it a dual noun, meaning two camps. You see, what Jacob has seen is that he's not just camped there by himself, but God is camped with him. Now, all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see at various places, God giving people this revelation. For example, before Joshua was about to take um, in, go into the battle of Jericho, uh, the army of the host of the Lord appeared to Joshua and he saw that he was not alone. God's armies were with him. Or Elijah in 2 Kings, he prayed for the Lord to open the eyes of his servant and his servant saw that they were surrounded by a great angelic hosts. He was not alone. And what God shows Jacob here is to see that there is not just one camp, but there are two camps that he is camped with Jacob. You see, the journey to life change always begins with Maniam. It always begins when it's revealed to us that we are not alone. When we realize that what God is actually calling us to do, He will empower us to do. That the standard that He's calling us to keep, He will actually empower us to keep. Maybe there's some people here today and you need that revelation. Maybe you're feeling dejected and despondent because you think you're alone. You've tried in your own strength to change. You've tried to, to put things off in your own strength, to stop things in your own strength, and you found it impossible. Maybe you need to cry out to God today to give you the revelation of Maniam, that you are not alone, that there are two camps, that God is camped with you. You see, when we get this revelation of Maniam, the two camps, that we are not alone, it will give us the courage to take a step of obedience. Jacob, after he receives this revelation of Maniam, he decides that he's going to obey the Lord, that he's going to return to the land of promise. But there's always a difficulty in obeying the Lord. Who here has found that when they step out in obedience, that when they step out to obey the Lord, there is always a difficulty. There is always something standing in their way. Who, who could testify to that? Well, there was a big someone for Jacob. It was Esau. Remember the last time we saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. He wanted to wipe him out. However, Jacob has just seen Maniam, the two camps. And so he steps out and he sends a messenger down in verse 4. Look in, in your Bibles in verse 4. The messenger sa he says to the messenger, This is what you are to say to my master Esau. 
Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, maidservants and manservants. Now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I might find favor in your eyes. I don't know about you, but as I read that, I don't see much humility in that statement from Jacob. There's no repentance. There's no coming to Esau and saying, Esau, I'm so sorry for tricking you. He's just relaying the facts. Well, in verse 6, the messenger comes back and says to Jacob, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and his 400 men are with him. Jacob has relayed the facts, and now the messenger has relayed the facts. There are 400 armed men coming to meet you. But this shouldn't bother Jacob. I mean, he's seen Maniam. He's seen the two camps. 400 men are nothing in comparison to the armies of the Lord. But look at how he responds down in verse 7. We read this, that he was filled with great fear and distress. And out of his fear and distress, he does three things. In verses 7 and 8, he divides his people into two groups so that if Esau wipes out one group, at least the, the other group will be left. Then in verses 9 to 12, he shoots a prayer to God to rescue them. And then third, under the cover of darkness, which shows how desperate and afraid Jacob is, he hatches a plan. In verses 13 to 18, he divides some of his property, his livestock, and he instructs his servants to give it to Esau as a bribe. And then look at this. He's going to send all of his livestock, all of his servants, all of his children, all of his wives to go in front of him, probably so that they can feel the wrath of Esau. What a wimp. He's sending all of his people in front of him so that they will be a shield before him. Now, why does he respond this way? Well, he responds this way because Jacob was a heel grabber. You remember that when Jacob was born, he was given the name Jacob. And the name Jacob means heel grabber. And he got this name because as he came out of the womb, he was grabbing the heel of his brother Esau. Now, the name Jacob or heel grabber was slang for someone who would use trickery and deception to get their way in life. You see, Jacob's, um, Jacob's motto was this, God helps them that helps themselves. Have you heard that expression before? God helps them that helps themselves. And if you don't help yourself, who will help you? You need to get the blessing, and the only way to get the blessing is to help yourself, is to plot, is to plan, is to scheme. And all throughout the story, we have been seeing Jacob's heel-grabbing ways. He wanted to get the blessing of the firstborn son, so he tricks his brother Esau out of the blessing. He wants to, get, he wants to be blessed and have many livestock, and so he tricks his father-in-law Laban out of all of those livestock. And so here he comes to this situation where Esau is coming with 400 men and he's filled with distress and he's afraid and he hatches a plan again. And this is because he is a heel grabber because deep down he still believes that God helps them that helps themselves. I wonder, can you relate to Jacob? I wonder if you're a heel grabber. I wonder if you deep down find it difficult to trust God. I wonder if deep down, deep down, you really believe that God helps them that helps themselves. That God can't be trusted. I need to give God a hand. God can't be trusted to provide for my needs. I need to give Him a hand. God can't be trusted to promote me in my work. I need to use scheming, political games. I need to use trickery. God can't be trusted with my identity. I need to actually prove to everyone how great and worthy I am. And so you use heel-grabbing ways. God helps them that helps themselves. Unfortunately, many people end and finish their journey to life change in Maniam. Many people I've seen get a revelation that God is with them, that there is two camps, and they take a step of obedience. But because they deep down believe that all they have is themselves, that God helps them, that helps themselves, they end up in fear, they end up afraid. They end up just doing all these sorts of heel-grabbing ways. You see, if you are going to truly change, your life needs to go on to Jabbok. Look down in verse 22. We read this. 
That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, and he crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he'd sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, in Hebrew, this whole scene is just one big play on words. You see, the name Jacob in Hebrew is spelt like this, Jacob. And the Hebrew word for wrestle is abok, and the Hebrew word for jabok is spelt like this. So Jacob got abok in jabok. <laughs> so jabok, it stands for the place of wrestling. In jabok, Jacob went into a wrestle, and his abok in jabok would change his life forever. You see, there are a number of mysteries for us in Jabbok. The first is this, is that Jacob is not just wrestling against any man, but he is wrestling against God. Look down in verse 30, 25, we read this. When Jacob saw that the man could not overpower him, he touched the socket of the, Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. This was probably the first indication to Jacob that he wasn't just wrestling against any man, but that he was wrestling against someone with divine power because the man could just touch his hip and cripple him. Another indication is found in verse 26. The man says, look at it with me. He says to Jacob, let me go for it is day, uh, daybreak. This mysterious man with supernatural power did not want to allow Jacob to see his face and Jacob gets the point. He says to the man, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob has realized that this is not just any man. But this man is somehow connected to God. Now, we'll explore that in a few moments. But the point is, whoever this wrestler was, God was wrestling Jacob through him. So in Jabbok, God comes to us in the midst of our fear and our distress, and he wrestles against us. He struggles against us. But you might be thinking, wait, Timon, I thought the New Testament teaches that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark age. And you're saying, Timon, that God comes and wrestles against us? Are you speaking heresy, Timon? Well, you see, many people have a view of reality that's like this, that God is on one side and that Satan is on the other and there is this spiritual conflict going on over the world. Now, there is a cosmic battle going on for the world, but I would put forward to you that this is not entirely correct. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, he said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. That's pretty encompassing, isn't it? All authority. Every bit of authority has been given to Jesus. So a better understanding of reality is a bit like this, is that God reigns over the world and Satan is struggles against that reign, but Satan as well is under God's authority. He is under God's feet. But you still haven't explained, Timon, how God can wrestle against us. Well, to explain that, I need to define our terms. You see, our struggles come to us in the form of trials. And trials are struggles or hardships that come from living as part of a fallen world. The Bible says quite clearly that God is good. And he's not the cause of any of our struggles or hardships. He is a good God. But what it says is that God is so sovereign that he can use our struggles and our hardships as the instrument in his hand to perform surgery on us. Uh, John Calvin put it this way. He said, with God's left hand, he allows trials to come against us. But at the same time, with his right hand, he sustains us and empowers us to go through those trials. Now, if God is a God of love and he allows us to go through trials, what does that say about our trials? They must be an expression of his grace. This is a mind-blowing thought, isn't it? Just think about the trial that you're going through right now. It's not actually God is allowing that to happen and it's not because he hates you, but it's because he loves you. You are in Jabbok. You are wrestling, and it's not because God hates you, but it is because God loves you. But the second mystery of Jabbok is even more mind-blowing. God allows Jacob to prevail. He allows Jacob to win the wrestle, just to make sure we all know what's going on here. God, the eternal, 
the all-powerful, all-knowing God is wrestling against Jacob, the God who can just touch his hip and with his finger and it falls out of joint, the God who made heaven and earth is wrestling against Jacob, but this God allows Jacob to win. What a mystery. Why would the eternal God allow this to happen? Well, that leads us to our third mystery in Jabbok, and that is you overcome when you don't exalt yourself, but rather when you come to the end of yourself. Look down in verse 26. It reads this. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, we could read that perhaps as an expression of Jacob's strength or as an expression of his tenacity. But rather than reading it that way, this is actually an expression of Jacob's desperation. In Hosea chapter 12 and verse 4 is a commentary on this passage. And it says that Jacob, as he writhed in pain with his hip dislocated, he cried out and called out to God to bless him. You see, at Jabbok, we are forced to admit something. You see, at that moment... Jacob's opponent asks Jacob an important question. He says, what is your name? Now, this is a very important question. And Jacob says, I am Jacob. I am a heel grabber. God had finally got Jacob to the place where he admitted who he really was, that he could not do it himself. You see, God does not help those who help themselves. He lets them fall on their face. God only, only blesses the humble. God only blesses the broken. And it's only when you come to the end of yourself, when you are forced to admit that you are a heel grabber, you're forced to admit the truth of who you really are, that your life will actually change. You know, so many times... We hide the truth of what's really going on in our hearts. We're good evangelical Christians. We've learned to play the game of keeping up appearances, keeping up this appearance that everything is, is well in my soul, that everything's going great in my life, that, that, that my life is wonderful and there's no problems in my life and I come to church and I, I look all great. But I'm telling you, your life will never change until you get to that place where you admit what's really going on in your soul, where you admit what is really happening, that you can't actually do it, that you need God, you need Him to bless you. Unless you get abocked in Jabbok and you have come to the end of yourself, your life will not really change. You see, maybe there are some people here today and you need to know Maniam. You need to know that God is present in your life. You came in today and God was far from you or you thought that God was far from you. And you need a revelation today that God is there, the revelation of the two camps, that He hasn't abandoned you. But maybe there are some people here today and you're in the midst of the Valley of Jabbok and you need to come to the end of yourself and you need to admit who you really are. You need to admit what is really going on in your, in your life. Uh, John says it this way, if we walk in the darkness... We lie and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, His blood cleanses us from sin and we have fellowship with one another. You see, I wonder if there are some people here today and you're in the midst of Jabbok. And I know what that's like. And you need to come to the end of yourself and admit, I am a heel grabber. I've tried to help myself, God, and I just need you. And I want you. Well, it's interesting that as we come through this uh, journey, we see that finally, finally, Jacob's life is changed. We see in verse 28, after Jacob's confession, the man said to Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. The name Israel in Hebrew looks like this. It's made up of two parts, Shva, which means wrestle, and El, which means God. So as uh, Israel means God wrestler. You see, when someone's name changes in Scripture, it indicates that they've also had a change of character. So he's gone from heel grabber to God wrestler. He's been transformed. And I am telling you, you will only be transformed 
as you go through Menahem, through the valley of Jabbok, and as you are forced to admit that you can't do it and you need God in your life. But this journey is not complete. You see, Jabbok soon turns to Peniel. Jacob's opponent asks, please tell me your name. Uh, Jacob asked his opponent, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The name uh, Peniel in Hebrew means face of God. Now it's interesting in this text, here is another mystery. It's quite clear that Jacob wrestled with an ish in Hebrew, a man. But then he says he's seen the face of God. Now I only know of one person who is both God and man, and that is Jesus. So we might have here an example of the pre-incarnate Christ. That just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they, they were in the fiery fur furnace with one like the Son of Man, we have here Jesus coming and wrestling against Jacob. And when Jacob cries out in desperation for God and came to the end of himself, he came to Peniel. He came to that place where he saw the face of God. You see, every temptation and every trial is really a temple. It's a sacred place of worship. We've come here to worship God today. But every trial is also a temple. It's a place where we are forced to empty ourselves and look to God for fullness. Look to God for everything in our lives. And the seed of the covenant of promise, Jesus, he went through his own valley of Jabbok in the garden of blood and tears when he denied himself and said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He went to Jabbok. He went to the cross. And on the cross, his flesh was crucified for you and for me. And a Roman centurion looked at him and said, Behold, this man is the Son of God. And when you and I come to the end of ourselves and our flesh is crucified, our independent self-reliance is crucified, people will see Christ in us. You see, the goal of life transformation is not getting a thinner waistline. It's not getting more discipline. It's not becoming all of those things. It's actually looking like Jesus. And there's only one way that you will look like Jesus. If you take the journey through Maniam, through Jabbok, and to Peniel. I wonder, where are you in the journey today? As I said, there are some people here who may need Maniam. They may need to call out to God to give them a reassurance that He is present with them. There are other people here today and you are in the valley of Jabbok. You are going through some tough stuff. I want you to know that this is not because God, God hates you, but because He wants you to come to the end of, him, of yourself and really confess who you really are, that you need Him. You need Him above all other things. And when you go through the end of that, you will come to Peniel. You will know God in a deeper and more intimate way. I wish I could tell you that there are other ways in which to know God. That there is another journey that you need to go on. But this is actually the journey that the Bible describes. In John 15, Jesus said, If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And he said, My father is the vine dresser. And he prunes every vine that bears fruit so that it may be more fruitful. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, Father, as we come to the end of this service and I recognize that there are a lot of people in different places this morning. Some people have been wrestling, wrestling. wrestling they've been in the valley of Jabbok we thank you that this is so that we will come to the end of ourselves and recognize that you are our all in all we will die to self and we'll experience your grace flowing into our lives father I just pray that your grace would be upon us we want to know you more Lord we pray let's stand and let's worship.